Welcome to Trinity Presbyterian Church. I'm Pastor Josh, and we're so glad you're here worshiping with us today. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know that on our website, there are some resources for children and adults to help assist with worship. F furthermore, you'll also find a connection card. We'd love for you to fill this out. Let us know you're here with us today and if you have any prayer requests. And with that, let's prepare our hearts for worship. Good morning. I'm Carla DiRamo, and I'm here to worship with you on this beautiful Sunday morning. You know, God doesn't care where we worship him at, where we praise him from, just that we do worship and praise him. So I want to take that opportunity for us to do the call to worship together. Our reading today comes from Psalm 89, which states, I will sing of the Lord's love forever with my mouth and will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. The heavens praise your wonder, Lord, your faithfulness too in the assembly of the Holy Ones. Let us worship God. kingdom come let you will be done let your fire flow let your fire flow Friends, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, God promises to forgive us and renew us. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of one another. Righteous Father, we who own more than we use, 
proclaim more than we experience and request more than we need, we come asking for your forgiveness. We seek your salvation and then act like we save ourselves. We beg your forgiveness, then repeat our errors. We experience your grace, then act defeated. We rely on your power, but only in hard times. We have become confused and misguided. Forgive our every defection. Bring us to an unbroken commitment and a steady trust through Jesus Christ, who is the way of hope, the truth of God, and the life of love. And hear us as we continue to confess in the silence of our hearts. Friends, by water and the Holy Spirit, God gives us a new birth and through Jesus Christ forgives us all of our sins. Hear this good news from the first letter of Corinthians from Paul. For you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Almighty God, strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in everlasting life. Amen. Let us continue with our worship. Friends, drawn together by the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need, responding to each petition with, you are full of compassion. Let us pray. Unite your church, O God. Give all the baptized the gifts of repentance and reconciliation. Strengthen ecumenical partnerships and interracial cooperation among the churches and guide all who work to be your body in the world. O oh God, teach us your way. You are full of compassion. Protect your creation, O oh God. Teach us ways to live that do not harm what you have entrusted to our care. Give to the animals the habitat they need for life. Renew and enliven places of suffering from drought, flood, storms, or pollution. Especially continue to be with those recovering from the wildfires and Hurricane Laura. O oh God, teach us your way. You are full of compassion. Bless the nations, O oh God. Frustrate the designs of dictators. Guide legislators, civil servants, judges, and police toward the well-being of all. Infuse the coming election season with honesty and integrity. O oh God, teach us your way. You are full of compassion. Sustain us in our work, O oh God, and give employment to all those who need it. Shape societies to ensure fair treatment for all who labor. Help us to love our neighbors in and through our work. O oh God, teach us your way. You are full of compassion. Tend to all in need, O oh God. Assist all friends and family members who are seeking restored relationships. Give community to the lonely and welcome the outcast. Shelter all who are vulnerable in body, mind, or spirit, especially those we name here before you now.
O oh God, teach us your way. You are full of compassion. Receive once again, O oh God, our plea for the end of the coronavirus. Comfort those afflicted with COVID-19 and uphold our medical workers. Give youth a sense of responsibility for others and provide the world a vaccine. O oh God, teach us your way. You are full of compassion. All these things and whatever else that you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And let us continue in our worship. If you would join me in prayer. Uh, gracious God, we ask that you would speak to us today, that you would encourage us, that you would challenge us, that you would draw us closer to yourself and to each other. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, this past week, I started reading a new book by Rabbi Jonathan Sachs from the UK. It's called Morality, Restoring the Common Good in Divided Times. Uh, in it, he points out that Western society has been moving from a we culture to an I culture. Uh, we used to view ourselves as part of larger groups. We saw ourselves as being together. We were a people who would join, who would connect, who would get involved and stay involved. But somewhere between the 1960s and today, we have slowly but inexorably moved to an I culture where we view ourselves differently and where we ask a different kind of question. What's in it for me? What will it cost me? How will it change me? And with that, we have more trouble than making sacrifices, staying in relationships, and even staying committed to anything larger than just ourselves. In the book, Rabbi Sachs writes of some of the consequences of this shift. When the I takes precedence over the we, the result is weakened relationships, marriages, families, communities, neighborhoods, congregations, charities, regions, and entire societies. Because, of course, any kind of community is based on putting the needs of the we before the needs of the I. And in doing so, we learn to ask a different set of questions. When we are a we society, we learn to ask questions differently. How can I help us? What's best for us? What can we accomplish together? Alas, more and more we have been moving away from that kind of thinking as we have moved toward an I-centered society. Uh, and we are feeling some of the repercussions of this change. Uh, Rabbi Sachs writes, Divisive politics, inequitable economics, the loss of openness in universities, and the growth of depression and drug abuse are the result of what I call cultural climate change. They are the long-term consequences of the unprecedented experiment embarked on throughout the West a half century ago, the move from we to I. And I think this highlights the problem that we are going to be starting with today. And the problem is this. We have a deep need, a deep longing to belong. And yet... We also have become a people who pride ourselves on our individualism. But of course, this leads us to become more isolated. 
What's more, as we become more isolated, we come to a growing sense of our own inadequacy, insecurity, and even insignificance. We long to be a part of a community, and yet we have also learned to not need anyone else. But of course, the problem with going it alone is you end up lonely. The problem with not needing anyone else is that no one knows that they might need you. The problem with focusing on self is that we fail to see how we are better together. And this is hard. It's not always when we face these decisions. In fact, it often seems best to choose yourself in any moment, in any decision, even if that ends up hurting us in the long run. And there's often a cost to choosing and committing to a group in the short term, even if that does help us in the long term. Interestingly, in that same book, Rabbi Sachs comes to this point in a rather odd way through a problem that Charles Darwin discovered. He, he writes, if natural selection were true, if the evolution of species was determined by competition for scarce resources, then you would expect only the most ruthlessly self-interested to survive. Selflessness has no place in the Darwinian system, and Darwin rightly acknowledged that. Altruists, especially people who risk their lives for the sake of others, would tend to die disproportionately young because of the risks they took. So they were more likely than others not to have had a chance of handing on their genes to the next generation. In short, altruists as a species should be extinct. But of course, that's not the case. To try and put it a little bit more succinctly, how do these selfish genes produce selfless people? But as Darwin dug into it further, he found something different as he looked not at just individuals, but at groups. While an individual can always get ahead by being selfish, a family or a herd, or a tribe will always be stronger than the individual, and, interestingly, an altruistic group will always be stronger than a selfish collective. Because they are willing to share, to help, to care, and because of that, the members of this altruistic group can learn to trust each other, which changes everything. But here again we find our problem. We want, we even need, we long for being in that kind of a community. And yet we have become a people of eyes. And have become bad at belonging. We need to belong, we want to belong, and yet we struggle with. So what do you do? What do we do? While we think about that, let me tell you where we're going. Today we begin a new fall series exploring our longing for community, for closeness, for connection. There's something in us that knows we need people. We need family. We need friends. We need to be a part of a group, a posse, a tribe, a club. We want to know that we belong. But as much as we long for these things, we also push against them as well. Because the reality is that community comes with a cost. And to be quite frank, we are often unwilling to pay that price. We don't want to commit. We don't want to risk. We don't want to show weakness. We don't want to be vulnerable. We don't want to admit that we might need someone else, anyone else. And this is the conundrum that we face. We know we need community. We even at times want community. But too often that need and that want aren't enough to overcome our fear, our apathy, our busyness, our insecurity, our selfishness. And so we don't pursue community. So let's dig into all this. And more than that, let's see how God satisfies this longing to belong in us. 
So if you would, I would invite you to turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 18. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 18. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like Him. For we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children. Do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin, because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning, because they have been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. For this is the measure you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Amen. Before I read our passage, I talked about our problem, about how we and our world celebrate individualism, and yet how we also have a deep longing to belong. So how does God solve the problem? What is God's plan to to bring us in, to connect us, to change us, and then to change others through this? Well, at its simplest, the answer is, All throughout our passage, God brings us into his family. The passage says it this way. We are called children of God. We are born of God. We have become brothers and sisters in and of Christ. And so let's take a couple of minutes and look at all this. What are the benefits of family? What are the costs and the challenges of family? And how might we find belonging in family? Not to mention how are we changed by family. When you think about your own family, you probably can come up with some of these points for yourself. What are the benefits? There are a lot of benefits to being a part of a family. There also are sometimes a lot of challenges to being a part of a family. And yet we are often changed through our family. It's worth pointing out, even here, that the way we're even talking about all of this is very individualistic. What are the benefits of family to me? What are the costs of family to me? How might this change me? There's an irony here that I'm trying to sell you on the idea of we, but I have to do it in the language of I because that's who we are and how we think. Even if 
those aren't the right questions to begin with. But we'll get there too. So let's start with the benefits of belonging to a family, and more specifically, to God's family. Because the reality is that at its simplest, the amazing benefit and blessing that occurs in this passage is a change in our status, a change to our belonging. God, in in trying to love us, in, in wanting to show us his love, has brought us into his family. And I find that interesting because he could have he could have just made us friends. And this would have been a, a privilege beyond our wildest hopes and expectations and dreams. And it would have had the added bonus of still keeping us a little bit at arm's length, because it would have given God the option of pulling away if he needed to or wanted to. Because, of course, the difference between friends and family is that you can choose your friends. You can work on a friendship, and if need be, you can choose to walk away from your friends. If God had made us friends, he could have kept the option of walking away if he needed to. But that's not what he did. Instead, he made us family. And family is different. Because family is always family, whether you like it or not. Family is always a place you belong. Family is always a place that takes you back. And this is why it's so amazing that God made us family. By doing this, he's saying that we'll never be apart. He's saying that he'll never walk away. He's saying that he'll always be there with us and near us and for us. And why? Because he loves us. Because we're family. Of course, that all sounds amazing. That all sounds great. That's all good, good news. But there might be a little bit of a catch. In fact, you may, you may have to read the fine print on this one because, you see, in making you a part of God's family... He also made the rest of us part of the family as well. So suddenly the family isn't just you and Jesus, it's you and Jesus and all of the rest of the Christian family. And this means that there are a lot of people in the family that don't look just like you, and they don't think just like you, and they don't act just like you, and yet they are all just as much a part of the family as you are. We are all bound together by God in the family of God. We'll talk about some of those challenges and costs in a moment, but first let's continue just with recognizing the benefits. Because what this means is that we are all in this together. We are in it with you and for you because we are all siblings in the family of God. The way that this should work is that we are more connected with each other than we might be with others who are way more like us simply because we are part of the same family. It's like the saying goes, families are like branches on a tree. We all grow in different directions, yet our roots remain as one. And it's this connection that provides us the support and the security and the belonging that we long for. Of course, the family isn't only for you, and it's not all about you, and it's not always easy either. In fact, the reality is that there is a cost to being a part of a family. When you're all by yourself, you can do whatever you want, whenever you want, without anyone else's inputs or insights or opinions. It's all up to you. In a family, it's different. Suddenly, you can't do whatever you want, whenever you want, independent of everyone else. Suddenly, you have to surrender some of your own freedom for the sake of the whole. Suddenly, the needs of the family come before your own needs and wants. In many ways, these are the costs of being a part of a family and really any kind of community. More to the point, it becomes our job as a part of the family to care for one another, to look out for the other, to sacrifice for each other. But that's not all. 
the cost of family isn't just the ways that we have to serve the other members of the family, because more than that, we are also called to serve the family itself. Because God has made, and as we commit to one another, we create a whole new family, a whole new entity. And this family, or again, any group, has its own needs and wants, its own purposes and priorities, its own way of acting and relating and being. And we need to give up some of our own freedom and time and resources for the whole. We need to put the needs and the purposes of the whole ahead of our own. We need to commit not just to the other individuals, but to this larger entity, which is the family. Of course, because of that, family is not just able to accomplish more than we could before. It's able to become something else entirely. And don't forget that we're not talking about just any family here. We're talking specifically about God's family. And there are times when it seems like this family has some extra costs and challenges. I mean, in most families, there are challenges. In fact, I've heard it said that most families are a lot like fudge, mostly sweet, eh, but with a few nuts. And yet it seems sometimes like the family of God is filled with a lot more sweetness. In a book called Uncomfortable, the author writes, The reality of God's family is that people have different backgrounds and personalities and opinions. They will clash. It will be messy. It's a huge challenge committing to a family like this, but it's not optional. Adopted sons and daughters of God can't just throw in the towel and retreat to our just-like-me friend groups and homogeneous cliques. We must lean into the awkward conglomeration of people who comprise the church. And yet, this is what makes us strong. This is what helps us to change. This is how we belong. Now before we talk about how we're changed by our belonging, by our community, by being a part of this family, we first need to acknowledge that this isn't the point. Because if you've been following along so far, you've already fallen prey to the dangers of our individualism. Because you see, the whole sermon, including this final point, are all couched in the language of I, in the language of individualism. What's in it for me? What are the benefits for me? What are the costs to me? How will this change me? Is it worth it to me as if I am the point of the family? But of course I'm not. It is so much a part of who we are that it's hard to see things in a different way. We look to community and family and belonging for what we can get out of it. We evaluate the effectiveness by how we are changed and by how much help we receive. We are in it only insofar as we find a benefit. And that's not to say that there aren't any benefits. Of course there are, but that's not the point. That's not why we commit. That's not why we We are a part of a community. You see, I think that in some ways is the problem. We have a tendency to evaluate community like this. We innately always keep one foot a little bit out the door. We sit on the sidelines. We hold ourselves a little bit apart, but often in judgment. And in so doing, we miss out on the transforming power of community. We miss out on the belonging that we long for. We miss out on being a part of something larger than just ourselves. And the community misses out on us. It's with all this in mind that we then need to look beyond our individualism because it's the only way for us to belong It's the only way for us to be changed. As we become a part of something larger than ourselves, as we commit, as we belong, we are transformed. 
because we are taking on goals that are bigger than our own, because we are adopting larger values that can only be realized in community, because we are being conformed to a new way of living. In setting aside some of our individualism, we start to care about things larger than ourselves. And as we do, we learn to serve wider. We learn to see farther. We learn to love bigger. And then this is multiplied a thousandfold because of the family that we've actually been talking about. Because remember, we're not just talking about any family. We've been brought into the family of God. And one of the things that makes this family so unique, so different from every other family or community is our older brother, Jesus. For he has set the model of what it looks like to be a part of this family. And so we are supposed to take on his mannerisms, his outlook, his actions, his viewpoint, his love. And we are to live that out in the family, through the family, and out into the world. He is the example that we are trying to emulate. But more than that, he then is also at work with us, working through us to bring about this change. But we have to let him. We have to come close and bring our whole selves. We have to be all in. We have to commit. Because that's the only way that belonging works. The problem that many of us regularly feel is that we long to belong. We long to be a part of a family, a group, a tribe, a a community. And yet our individualism tries to keep us from joining, from fully committing, from sticking with it. But God brings us into his family. He doesn't just call us friends. He makes us family. Such that we are children of of God, such that we are brothers and sisters with Christ. We have been brought in, and we find that we belong. And this gives us the freedom and the space to continue to commit and conform ourselves to this new way of life. And we do this as we learn to serve one another, and then ultimately, through the family, the rest of the world. Let us pray. Lord God, we long to belong. We long to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. We long to to know that we are needed and desired. And you have brought us in. You have brought us into the family of God. You have made us your children. You have made us brothers and sisters with Christ. Lord, help us to live this out. Help us to love like that. Help us to love like Christ who laid down his life for us. Sacrificially. And because of his love. Lord, we thank you for this mystery and this good, good news. Help us remember it and help us live as members of your family. Help us become more like our older brother. We pray these things in his name. Amen. And now let us continue in worship. Thank you. 
from the book of Psalm 136, verses 1 to 3. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks for the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of Lord. His love endures forever. We are obviously not going to be passing the plate, but please let us take the time to give of ourselves in response to God. Please join me in prayer. Almighty God, giver of every good and perfect gift, teach us to render to you all that we have and all that we are, that we may praise you, not with our lips only, but with our whole lives, turning the duties, the sorrows, and the joys of our days into a living sacrifice to you, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. At this time, let us give of our tithes and offerings. now let us affirm our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now let us continue in our worship.
Uh, before we're done today, I've got a couple quick announcements. First, if you are visiting with us, we are so glad that you are visiting with us in this time. Uh, I want to encourage you and really everyone, find the connection card on the online worship page, the page that linked to the video you're now watching. Scroll all the way to the bottom. Let us know that you are worshiping with us. Let us know how you're doing. Let us know how we can be praying together as a church. Uh, the second announcement is that uh, I want to just commend to you our daily offices. It, it's a new discipline, actually, it's a really old discipline uh, that we are using right now to pray together and to feel more connected. Uh, you can sign up on the e-news, and what it is is a small text message that will happen Monday through Friday at 9 a.m. and 4.30 p.m., just a prompt to pray. But the difference is we're all doing it together at that exact same time. And so we are together being a part of the church community, even though we are physically apart. Uh, so I want to commend that to you. It's in the uh, e-news. Uh, and then finally, the other announcement is we are still uh, rolling out these new uh, worship gatherings. Uh, we'll continue our online worship for sure, but we are starting to gather back at the church uh, and in other locations. Uh, we are meeting outside. We are meeting in this room. Uh, and basically what these are are small gatherings of 10 to about 20 people with masks. We are sitting at tables or separated out by at least six feet. So we are uh, keeping some distance. Uh, we are doing what we need to to be safe, but we are also finding new ways in which we can worship together as a church family. Uh, we are spending some time learning. We are spending a lot of time praying, and we are spending a lot of time at the communion table together. So I would commend these to you. There's information in the e-news about it. There's also a new part of our website that will detail these out. Uh, the sign-ups begin on Wednesday uh, around 1.30 when the e-news goes out. That's when you can start signing up. Uh, if they fill up, Keep looking because sometimes uh, we will add spots to get us a little bit higher if we can keep the numbers uh, safe. So please uh, keep looking throughout the week. And um, we are kind of rolling these out one at a time. So as they fill up, we'll start making more. Uh, and so we need you to sign up so we know how much uh, need there is for these. So please look for those on the church website or in the e-news as well. And then finally, we are having a, a Zoom communion Sunday night uh, at 6 p.m. It's something we've done uh, at the first of the month for those who are online and can't do communion here physically with us. Uh, we are meeting at 6 p.m. via Zoom. Uh, there'll be an e-news that goes out uh, Saturday. Uh, prior to this uh, recording, and it will detail how to be a part of this, uh, and so I would encourage you to join us for that on Sunday evening at 6 p.m. Uh, that also will be on the website, so you can find more information there as well. Uh, and with that, receive the benediction. Know that you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and so live like the family of God. Live like the temple of the Holy Spirit. Live like the body of Christ. God's blessings be upon you today and forever. Amen.